watch this at night. Hey Curious Cats, my name is Sahara. Welcome to the True Crime channel. Let's get into it. I want to apologize about my voice. I've been uh, postponing filming for way too long. It's Saturday evening. Actually, it's Sunday right now. I've been sick for the past week and it doesn't seem to want to go away, so I apologize. All right, so let's get into it. For tonight's case, we're going to Canada with the case of Natsumi Kogawa. I don't know if you can hear, it's 2.35 in the morning and there's still people outside. I can hear them and it's annoying. Natsumi Kogawa was born in 1986 in Aomori, which is a city in Japan. It's located up north in the biggest island of Japan, the, the island of um, Honshu, Honshu, I think I'm saying that right. Natsumi has five brothers and her mother owns a store. People say about Natsumi that she's quiet but she's open to everybody. She always helps whenever she can. She's very polite, she's well-mannered, she's well-educated. She's a very curious person. She's interested in many things. She's very smart, she loves to learn, she loves to travel, she's an experienced traveler. She works for this huge company in Japan but as her mother said, uh, she has big dreams. So she gets in touch with a, an exchange study agency and she applies for a visa to go to Canada. Her visa is granted and in May 2016 she arrives in Vancouver, British Columbia. From what I've read, this is pretty adventurous for ja a Japanese person to, to kind of just, you know, leave everything behind. Apparently, if you're in Japan and you work for a big company, it's pretty unusual to just, you know, leave everything behind and move abroad. One of the reasons people choose Canada over the USA is because Canada is much safer. Canada has a lower crime rate, it doesn't have as much violence, especially gun violence, even though Canadians also have the right to, you know, carry firearms. Just generally speaking, it's a much safer country. One day, Nat was, her friends call her Nat, uh, she was walking around in the city and she was getting close to this homeless guy. And uh, there's a guy named Chris who saw her and he kind of wanted to protect her from this homeless man because he knows him. And this homeless man is like used to wandering around in this area and he's used to, you know, just loitering and, you know, begging people for money. He's, he's kind of a disturbance in the area. So Chris wanted to sort of protect her from that. And Chris works in the area, so he's familiar with you know, who hangs out there. So he approached her and he started speaking to her and they actually became friends. Christopher even claims that William, the homeless man, tried to rob him one day. He was unsuccessful, but he tried. Homeless people are just people. They just don't have a house. They're the same as you. They're the same as me. There's nice homeless people. There's mean homeless people. There's smart homeless people, dumb homeless people. William is not the nice kind, he's the mean kind, and he's also a drug addict, which makes his charming personality even more charming. I actually don't believe that addiction, drug addiction, or any addiction for that matter, makes you mean. I think it develops personality traits that you already have, but it doesn't create new ones. From my experience with addicted people, that's what I observed. I don't know if you agree with me. You should because I'm always right. Let's get back to the story. So Nat has become friends with Chris and over the summer she's she managed to make quite a lot of friends. She even found herself a boyfriend and despite the fact that a lot of people don't like William, she even befriended him. One day she was at the library and she was reading a book about craft beer. He was there, they bumped into each other and he started talking to her. He was like, oh, you like craft beer? I like craft beer too. Oh, wow, that's so cool. So they became friends. I think it actually says a lot about Nat, the kind of person that she was, the fact that she was, you know, so nice and caring and polite and she just saw the good in people. On September 8th, 2016, Nat goes to a calligraphy class, then she goes to the library downtown, and that same day in the evening she was supposed to meet a friend, and this friend has a friend who's a manager at a Japanese restaurant, and this manager friend offered to check out Nat's resume and possibly offer her a job. So the plan was for Nat and her friend to meet at the train station and go to the restaurant together, give her resume and maybe have a job interview on the spot. But Nat doesn't show up at the train station, so her friend 
sends her a text message. He tries calling her. He then goes to her house. He knocks. She doesn't seem to be there. Again, he sends her text messages. He even tries to email her. And then he decides to just, you know, walk back and forth from the train station to her house. And he just does that a couple times, hoping that he's going to bump into her. He doesn't. And at this point, he starts to get really worried. He keeps, you know, trying to contact her over the next few days and after five days so on monday he decides to call the police i don't know who called the police i know it was him for sure maybe his manager friend as well and maybe other friends what i know for a fact is that it was more than one person who called the police to uh, report her missing about two weeks into the investigation and search for nat police released a picture of her walking alongside a man in Harbour Centre Mall in downtown Vancouver. This picture was taken by CCTV footage and you're probably wondering who is that man? It's William, the homeless friend. William Victor Schneider, or Willie for family and friends, I'm just gonna call him William. He was born in 1967 in Vernon, British Columbia. Vernon is a city that's located about five hours east of Vancouver. William's mother passed away in the year 2000 and his father still lives in Vernon. William is a bully from a very young age and why doesn't that surprise me? He's a school dropout. He stopped going to school in the ninth grade. I had to look it up because we don't have grades in France. It's just a different system. But anyway, he was like 14, 15 years old. It is reported that once he set a cat on fire and he took bets with his friends as to what direction the cat was gonna go. Leave the cats alone. His past convictions include breaking and entering, assault, resisting arrest, assaulting a police officer, theft, drug possession, uh, armed robbery, and parole violation. I mean, the list is very long. In 1998, he was sent to prison for four years for the armed robbery. And at the time, he was 31 years old. I think it's pretty old to get yourself sent to prison. I know there's no age for prison, but I mean, stuff like that, like armed robbery, I don't know. Have you ever been arrested? Leave a comment and tell me if you've ever been arrested. I've been arrested a lot of times. I'm not a bad girl. I'm a nice girl. I am, I promise. Okay, let's keep going with the story. At all. At some point in his life, William meets a Japanese woman. They get married. She gets pregnant, but she decides to go back to Japan. Initially, this marriage is believed to have been for immigration purposes only. She was just trying to get, you know, residency in Canada. But then she changed her mind. She moved back to Japan and she asked for a divorce. In July 2016, William goes to Japan to try and convince her to come back to Canada and live with him. But she refuses. And when he came back, he was just feeling you know, lost and depressed. After he came back from Japan, that's when he met uh, Nat and they became friends. So as I said, Nat was last seen with him at the mall. She had uh, paid a drink for him and then they were heading towards uh, Stanley Park. While people are looking for her and before the um, picture is actually released, William went back to Vernon. He went to stay with his dad for... Well, we don't really know how long, but he just went there. I found out that while he was there, grandma celebrated her birthday. They had people over, they ate cake, took pictures, like everything was pretty normal. So at that point, the question is, does William know that Nat is missing? Three weeks after the investigation into Nat's disappearance has started, her body is found on September 29th inside a suitcase on an unoccupied property on Davy Street, the Gabriella Mansion. Quick word on the Gabriella Mansion. I googled it because I was wondering why it was unoccupied. Nobody had been living there for at least one decade and I was just curious. It's a gorgeous mansion. It's downtown. It's a freaking mansion. Apparently, it's a haunted mansion. It was built in the year 1900 and legend says there was a secret tunnel leading from the mansion to a bar slash nightclub slash speakeasy and it was mostly used during the um, prohibition era. This bar slash nightclub is said to have a ghost of its own. It's like these places are brother and sister. The Gabriola mansion at some point became an apartment unit, then it became a restaurant, then there was a fire and it was restored and I think nobody's been living there ever since the fire happened. But during its entire lifetime, people have reported being witness to crazy things happening inside the house, like objects in levitation, uh, noises in the kitchen, and some people say they saw 
the ghost of a man, possibly the ghost of Benjamin Rogers who built the house and who owned it for a long, long time. He died at the age of 53 of a cerebral hemorrhage. Why am I telling you all this? I don't know, I just found that information. I thought I'd share, I thought it was interesting. Haunted house. And just FYI, Chris, Nat's friend, claims that he reported William to police a couple times because he saw him around Gabriella Mansion offering passersby or tourists a tour inside the house for $5. It's pretty cheap. You should know that around this time, William either spends his nights in a hostel downtown or in his tent that he will put either, you know, in Stanley Park or wooded areas or sometimes in the Gabriella Mansion, like around the Gabriella Mansion on the property. The body was found in the bushes on that property and it was inside a suitcase, naked. It was badly decomposed and there was a cloth inside the anus. It's believed that the cloth was put there to prevent bodily fluids from leaking, I'm guessing, so there wouldn't be any smells and the body would not be found. I'm no expert on how and where to dump a body, but I'm, I'm gonna say downtown Vancouver is probably not a good idea. At this point, you're probably wondering how they found the body because it's an abandoned mansion. Nobody goes there except people who want to see ghosts or people who offer tours inside haunted houses. Meet Warren Schneider, brother to William Schneider. After the disappearance of Nat was reported on the news, Warren's daughter calls her dad that same day and she tells him about a picture of Uncle Willie and the missing Japanese student at the mall. So she's talking about the picture from the CCTV footage. So she's like, dad, why is there a picture of Uncle Willie with that missing person? The first thing Warren does obviously is he calls his brother and he's like, bro, what is happening? What's his response? No response. He doesn't answer. He actually hangs up the phone. Warren knows his brother is in Vernon, so he drives there and he asks him in person. William says, I did something very bad. He explains that he was dating this woman, Nat. He says they had three dates. The third date was the last one and everything the article in the news suspects is actually true, he says. The next day, William purchases $50 worth of heroin and he intends to overdose, you know, commit suicide on a heroin overdose. Right before he does that, he tells his brother where the body is located and he tells him, right after I die, you call police and you tell them everything. The two brothers then sit in the backyard, they hug, they cry, they take one last picture, and then Warren is just standing there watching his brother commit suicide. I'm no expert on suicide by heroin overdose, but I'm gonna say that $50 is probably not enough for someone who is a drug addict and who drinks all the time. I don't know, it's just a guess. I actually don't know. Imagine yourself in Warren's situation. Would you watch your own brother or sister commit suicide. On one hand, he did kind of admit to having killed someone. He did admit to disposing of the body and he knew where it was. But on the other hand, he's your brother. It's a difficult question. What would you do? I don't know what I would do. I know what I would do if I was in that situation. I think I'd probably tell my brother or sister to turn themselves in, repent for the sin, apologize to the family of the victim, just, you know, do your time. Pay your debt to society. Suicide is not a solution. But that's just my opinion. The suicide attempt will turn out to be ju just that, just an attempt. William will survive. He actually got ripped off. It was not good quality. The heroin was not good quality. Later that day, William calls his wife in Japan and Warren overhears the conversation. William supposedly said to his wife, have you heard about the missing Japanese student? I did it, I killed her. It's a fair assumption to say that he's talking about Natsumi Kogawa, right? Wrong. Remember, this is gonna be very important in a few minutes. Later that day, Warren calls the police as per William's instructions. He tells them where to find the body. So police finds it. And of course, they're also looking for Warren. They find him passed out in some wooden area under a tarp and they, you know, proceed with arresting him. During his interrogation, William says he was dating Nat. He tells investigators that on their first date, uh, she played the ukulele for him. 
I keep picking cases where I identify myself so much with the victim and I don't know why that is. It's not just to you, it's also her personality, the fact that she likes to travel, that she's curious. I just saw a lot of myself in her. Okay, now we have to stop for a second and talk about the we were dating. First of all, Nat has a boyfriend. Now granted, it doesn't mean that she is exclusive, but you should know that this exclusive, not exclusive thing is not international. We don't do that in France. And I know what you're thinking. French people, seriously, I know what you think of us and you are absolutely very, very wrong. I had this conversation with a friend one day and he was like, you know, when we think French and relationships and sex and stuff, we think menage à trois, we think open relationships, we think swinging and all sorts of crazy stuff. I'm, I'm gonna stop here because I said last time that I was not gonna talk about S-E-X. What I'm trying to say is we don't do that here. That's not how people do it here. Some people might do it, but it's not the way we proceed. I think it's fair to say that Japan works the same way. Now you could argue that, you know, when in Rome, whatever the rest of the expression is, I know it in French, I'm sorry, but I think you know what I mean. I think it would have taken more than a beautiful Canadian summer for Nat to just, you know, change her perception of life and her perception of you know, relationships and everything. So I'm not judging Americans out loud about the exclusive, non-exclusive thing. It's just that I think it's important to say that it's not an international thing. So she had a boyfriend and most likely she was not dating anybody else. And even if she was trying to get, you know, accustomed to Canadian customs, that is if they are the same as American, it probably would have taken her more than just, you know, a summer. I did check for Canada and apparently it's kind of the same you know, rule. <laughs> I did find this very interesting article about the 10 things you should know when dating in Canada. And number two is, I kid you not, you gotta love maple syrup. I'll put the link in the description box because I know you don't believe me. But on a more serious note and more importantly, I was just asking myself, why is it that when you're a woman and you have a guy friend and he's, you know, asking you to go out for drinks or whatever it may be, you see it as I'm hanging out with a buddy and he sees it as a date. I think all women have been through that at least once in their lives. Leonard. Yeah. Was this supposed to be a date? This? No. So, how was your date? Awesome. Kiss in point. So in William's head, he met Nat on three different occasions. To him, it was it was dating, and he's including the first time he met her at the library. All of Nat's friends, with no exception, all say the same thing. They were not dating. There is no way she would have been attracted to a guy like that. He had no job, he was a drug addict. Well, he was homeless, not that you couldn't date someone who's homeless, but they put that in the list, so we have to put it in the list. He has a criminal record, he's an alcoholic. I don't think there was anything about him that could have make her see him as, you know, boyfriend material. I think she pitied him. She probably liked him as a friend and maybe she was even trying to help. She's Japanese. She's, it sounds cliche, but she's Japanese. She's very polite. And maybe she was just too polite to refuse friendship with him. Remember people say about her that she's a very curious person. So maybe she was just, you know, being curious. Maybe she wanted to talk to this guy who's, you know, so different from her. And you know, she's traveling, she's, you know, discovering Canada and Canadians and other people. I met a homeless man in Seattle once. Do you see why I identify myself with her now? So yeah, I met this homeless guy in Seattle and he was just all very interesting. He was insightful, he was uh, smart, he had amazing stories to tell. He was so different from me and it was just nice to share, you know, our different, you know, perception of, of life. He's actually the one who told me that Bruce Lee was buried in Seattle. I had no idea. I thought he was buried in LA because that's where he had his school, right? So I don't, I had no idea. Thanks to him, I was able to go to Bruce Lee's grave and his sons and pay my respects. So it was a pretty great encounter for me. When you're traveling, and I guess it's fair to say that Nat is that kind of person you know, you travel, you just want to meet people, you want to talk to people, no matter where they're from, no matter what they do, no matter who they are, you just want to make new friends. You know, she was just trying to make new friends. So William says he met her the first time and it was a date. No, it was not. Then he met her on two other occasions and they were, again, dates. On the third one, they were supposed to go to Stanley Park to his tent and they were supposed to, you know, have S-E-X. 
sex. I don't want to say this word. I've been talking about that for the past three cases. I don't want to say this word. Do you believe that she was going to go to his tent and have sex with him in Stanley Park? He said that they agreed to this romantic encounter over email. But it's funny how the police never found that email. During his interrogation, William also explains to police, you know, his difficult family situation. He tells them that he has anger management issues, but he says that's in the past. So on the day she died, he explains that they were in his tent. He had brought methamphetamines. How nice of him. Nat actually refused to do drugs, which is very consistent with her personality, according to all her family members and all her friends. And he doesn't explicitly say that he killed her. He explains everything that happened during the date and he said something went heated and, and then something went very wrong. What he means by something when he did, I think is that he got upset that she had to leave for her appointment. So you remember that this evening she was supposed to meet her friend for, you know, dropping off her resume and possibly having a job interview. So she had to leave at some point and he was upset about that and he got angry. He's very confused about, you know, how and when she died. He says, I actually don't know if she died, if her heart went or if it was her breath. I don't know actually wasn't certain that she passed when she at the moment she did it was five minutes later i stepped out or gone out for a smoke and then oh my god i don't think she was at the time i don't think so the toxicology report revealed that she had anti-anxiety medication in her system as well as sleeping pills it could not determine how much of it but it was definitely in her system now chris her friend will later say that this absolutely does not make sense at all. She has a job interview that same evening. Why would she take a sleeping pill? And on top of that, anti-anxiety meds. It just doesn't make any sense. I think what happened was he had the exact same idea as David, remember? He just put something in her drink while she was looking the other way. I'm pretty sure that's what happened. Police ask him again and again, why did it happen? Why? He doesn't answer. He just sobs and he says, what it is is, it's my fault. Okay. The trial begins sometime in 2018. William pleads not guilty to the second degree murder charge, but he pleads guilty to interfering with a human body, also called indignity to a human body. Now, I wasn't sure if that was in reference to the cloth being found inside the victim's anus, or if it was because the body was naked and put in a suitcase and, you know, you know, disposed of in a, in an abandoned property. The defense's strategy is that the cause of death is undetermined. Their client just doesn't know how she died, but when she did, he panicked and he made poor decisions. Now, the prosecution had two major issues at this trial. The first one being that the cause of death could not be determined by the autopsy. The body was found in a very advanced state of decomposition. The toxicology report did reveal that she had, you know, traces of sleeping pills and anti-anxiety meds, but they just, they just couldn't tell how much of it. So maybe she died from an overdose or maybe she was asphyxiated. That was the other possibility. Just as an FYI, the drugs that were found in her system, they had not been prescribed to her. One of the police officers who interrogated William when he was arrested, did testify and he said that when they asked him over and over how she died, how she died, at one point he made this gesture. He covered his mouth and he pinched his nose, kind of showing that he smothered her. At that point, Natsumi's mother actually left the courtroom. She couldn't hear anymore. This is probably a mother's worst nightmare. I just felt so sad for her. During the trial, she did say, she also spoke to uh, reporters and she said that she had problems sleeping, she couldn't move on with her life, she had a hard time waking up in the morning and, you know, going to work, having the will and energy to go to work. Obviously, Warren testified as well, and he also answered uh, journalists' questions, and he said it was very hard for his family, and he he knows that it was also very hard for Natsumi's family. The autopsy also revealed that there were no bruises on Nat's face, no signs of a struggle or defensive wounds, nothing at all. But she was drugged. She had been drugged or she had taken drugs willingly. So it could have been very easy to smother her without it showing, without any signs on her face. The problem with the police officer's testimony is that the interrogation was actually not 
videotaped. It was only recorded, you know, the audio only was recorded. So the police officer says that, but there is absolutely no proof. And it's a wonder, like they did ask this question at the trial, why is it that they didn't film it? The other major issue at the trial was that all the evidence was circumstantial. There was no DNA evidence found on the victim and everything they had was circumstantial. They had the uh, CCTV footage of Nat with William at the mall. They also had CCTV footage of William leaving his hostel with a suitcase and then coming back a few hours later without the suitcase and he changed his clothes for some reason. In case you don't know the difference between circumstantial and direct evidence, I think it's called direct evidence. Well, that's how we say it in French, so it must be the right way. Maybe it's very obvious, but I don't know why I feel the need to explain it. When it's circumstantial, basically it means that you have certain elements that lead you to this to a certain conclusion, but you don't have a direct evidence. A direct evidence, for example, would be if you have CCTV footage of William actually killing Natsumi, this is direct evidence because you're, you're seeing it. But there is no such thing at the trial. It's just things that make you get to the conclusion that it can only be him. Like, it, it has to be him. But you can't know for sure. Warren's testimony played a huge part, as you can imagine, because it was so incriminating. During the trial, the brothers did not make eye contact at all until Warren testified. At that point, they locked eyes. Warren looked at his brother. Um, he nodded and then he left the courtroom. Can you feel the tension? It's like you're there. Despite the fact that all evidence is actually circumstantial, it was enough for the judge to find William Schneider guilty of second degree murder and sentence him to life in prison with 14 years without the possibility of parole. Wow, I made that sentence in one go. You have no idea how much I edit. It's just a nightmare. Every time I have to repeat myself like three times, four times, so when I get it right, it makes me happy. In Canada, when you're found guilty of second degree murder, the sentence is always life in prison with 10 to 25 years without the possibility of parole. William was also sentenced to three and a half years for the other charge, the uh, indignity to a human body, and that sentence would be served concurrently with the other one. And this does not conclude the tragic story of Natsumi Kogawa. William actually appealed his sentence last spring, and here's how and why he was able to do that. Like, on what grounds? So you remember that Warren, his brother, testified and he said he overheard the conversation, blah, blah, blah. This was admitted as evidence during the trial, but William's attorneys um, argued that before allowing the jury to uh, hear that conversation, the judge should have made it admissible as a piece of evidence, or not. Which apparently he did not do. He just said to the jury, look, we have this, you know conversation that was reported from the brother, do with it what you will, but we just have like bits and pieces. That's what he said. And sadly for the prosecution, that is not how it works. You have to make it admissible or not admissible. So when you do that, both parties actually have the possibility to argue you know, in favor or against that piece of evidence. The defense was not able to do that because it was never questioned. I don't know if it makes sense yet, but it will just give me a couple more minutes to explain in more detail. The defense argues that what was, you know, mentioned about this conversation, it has no context. So when William says to his wife, have you heard about the Japanese student, the missing Japanese student? And when he says, I did it, I killed her, they are actually three separate sentences that are, you know, outside of their context. Another argument that the defense makes is that we don't know what's being said on the other end. We don't know what his wife is actually saying. And it does make sense because consider this. When he says, I did it, he could have been talking about anything. That is true and that makes sense. One thing that does not make sense is when the defense argues that when he's talking about the missing Japanese student, he doesn't actually say Natsumi's name. I mean, he could have been talking about anybody else. It's kind of too big to swallow, but okay. And the third thing is, the most incriminating sentence, when he says, I killed her, they, I mean, this is where you understand that attorneys make a lot of money and they kind of deserve it. They came up with <laughs> the possibility that maybe he was being asked the question, why didn't you go to police? To which he would have answered, because they would think I killed her. Oh, isn't that brilliant? Isn't that genius? Remove that first part of the sentence and it does sound like an admission of guilt when really it could be anything but that. This stupid 
Well, it's not really stupid, but to me, it's a technicality. But this allowed the um, appeal to be allowed. There's going to be a second trial, but I actually don't know when because the appeal was granted earlier this month. So, you know, early February 2021. So we don't know when the new trial is going to be. This is very frustrating, especially for Natsumi's mother, because she is going to have to go through a new trial all over again and hear, you know, all the horrific details of her, you know, decomposed body and not actually even knowing what exactly happened. But to be honest, I'm not too worried about the outcome of the second trial because the first trial, everything they had was circumstantial and they still, you know, sentenced him to life. I think there's just too much evidence. Even if it's only circumstantial, I think it's just too much evidence. The CCTV at the mall, at the hostel, uh, the suitcase, which reminded me of, you know, Chris Millane's case. The fact that he knew where the body was, I mean, he's the one who basically told the police where it was through his brother and the fact that he's a drug addict, the fact that he's, you know, has no job and everything. I mean, I don't know. There's nothing in his psychological profile that is going to help him. It's something I didn't mention up until now. He actually tried to do the exact same thing to another woman in the past, except this woman survived. Same MO, he put his hand over her mouth and he tried to pinch her nose and he tried to suffocate her, to smother her. But she survived. And I don't have her name. I don't know who it is. I don't know if she testified at the first trial. I don't know if she's going to testify at the second trial. I hope she does. But yeah, same thing happened. So I'm pretty confident. William promised to... Who is driving at this time of night? It's 3.50. Oh my god, it's 3.50. They're not going to work. Don't tell me they're going to work. It's Sunday. People work on Sunday, but sorry, I digress. It's really annoying when you hear noises like that in the background because I hear them. You don't, you won't because editing skills. So I was saying, William promised Natsumi's mother that he was going to write a full confession to kind of give them, you know, closure and help them understand what happened and you know, also apologize. They're still expecting that letter. Now the story is over. I mean, technically not because there's another trial happening soon. I don't know when, but happening soon. I will post an update when I have more information. I will, you know, either put it in the description box or as a comment, pinned comment. Time for the random item review. And tonight I'm going to talk about my French press. You know, in French, we don't say French press. We don't say French fries either. I mean, it would be stupid to say French fries. We just say fries. The frites Francaise sounds awful. French fries, frites, French press, press. Oh no, you learned something today. I don't know if you're a coffee drinker, but you know, obviously you can only use it to make coffee. And it's pretty simple the way it works. You just, you know, boil some water. You put your coffee, you know, inside. Then you put your boiling water in it. And then you wait a few minutes and then you just press. So, you know, the coffee powder stays at the bottom and doesn't go inside your cup. It's 4 a.m. here, so I'm obviously not drinking coffee. This cup is empty. I just want you to see how cool I look when I'm drinking my morning coffee. This press was actually a gift from a friend. I did have one that I bought myself and I broke it because that's what I do. I just break stuff. I was in tears when I did. I should not be crying about a French press. But I was just really sad because it was really expensive because it's really beautiful and it kind of matches my environnement. And also, I just was stuck with this mini version of a press and this is enough for like not even a cup. Especially if it's a like a mug, like this big, like this is pretty big. I drink two of those in the morning, but my coffee is super, super, super light, so... I'm not a coffee addict. This is cute. This is the same brand, great quality, but it's just not enough. That's it. I'm done. I can go to sleep. Thank you so much for watching till the end. I am in such a good mood. I have no idea why. Like I filmed my French version and I felt sick because I am sick. I still am sick. Like my nose is still a bit runny and I think I still have a fever. It's not COVID, thank God, but it still was pretty bad. Like for a few days, I just couldn't I couldn't think, I couldn't do any, I couldn't even lie down because uh, my head was just hurting so much, like really, really, really bad. I w I'm a woman, like when I say I'm in pain, I'm in real, actual pain. Please consider subscribing to my channel. It would be a huge 
help. And if you have a suggestion to make for the upcoming videos, please leave a comment or send me a message on social media and I will see you soon. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.